Welcome to Crawl Space. I'm Tim here today with Lance. Lance, how are you today? Doing fantastic today, Tim. Thank you so much for asking. I hope all the listeners out there are doing just as well as I'm doing. Very excited about the guests that we have on today. I love, as you know, Tim, wrapping the week up with a fun conversation that is true crime centric, but not as true crime heavy. But before we get to all of that, I'm going on and on. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks a lot for asking. I'm excited to speak with our old friend, Michelle Tooker. In this interview today, she has written a new book called True Crime Trivia. But before we get to that, I just want to mention our premium feed. If you want every single episode of Crawl Space ad-free, you can get that on Apple Podcasts on Crawl Space Premium. Or if you're not an Apple user, you can go to crawlspace.supportingcast.fm and sign up there. It's $4.99 a month. You get early releases, you get every episode ad-free, and you get our weekly bonus show. And Tim, we just recently decided to do an Ask Us Anything. So if you are a subscriber, you'll be getting an email address where you can send an email to us and we will provide you with a secure link. That information will be coming soon. And Tim, more information will be coming right now when you tell people where to find us on social media. Find us at Crawl Space Podcast or Crawl Space Pod. Thanks a lot for listening. We're going to cut to commercial quick and we'll be right back. And a thank you to our sponsors. Back to the program. Welcome to the podcast, Michelle Tucker. How are you today? Great. How are you guys doing? Good to see you again. Great to see you. And thank you for joining us. And thank you for putting together this amazing book that you've put together. It's a delight to have you on. How have you been? Very good. Yeah, just I've been busy with researching for True Crime BS with Josh Hallmark and also writing this book and getting it out there and um, starting my own social media for this book as well. It's great to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Of course. Yeah. Thanks a lot for joining. So the book is called True Crime Trivia, 350 Fascinating Questions and Answers to Test Your Knowledge of Serial Killers, Mysteries, Cold Cases, Heists, and More. Congratulations on the book. How has the feedback been so far? Thanks. Yeah, it's been great so far. I've heard from a lot of readers that they really enjoy the format, how I organized it with multiple choice and true false answers so people can test their knowledge as they're reading. And then also they could host like an event or get a group of friends together and sort of test their true crime knowledge. And people have appreciated that I've covered a range of different true crime topics, not just serial killers, but also gone into some interesting stories about heists and robberies and cold cases, true crime podcasts celebrity crimes, things of that nature. Great. And the next natural question I think a lot of people have, and it's the question that I had, was why write a book like this? And then I saw two questions back to back, and I realized the importance of writing a book like this. But I'd like to hear it from you. You you kind of describe it in the opening of your book. Tell people why you decided to do a true crime trivia book. Sure. Well, I've always been a writer myself um, since I was even before literacy. I used to like scribble stories on construction paper and kind of memorize what they were. So I've always been into the storytelling world. And I was writing a children's book of like conversation starters. And I really enjoyed that process. And I said, you know what, I listen to watch and read a lot of true crime. I w- that was also around the same time that I began doing some true crime podcast research. So I figured, why don't I write a book on this? I have a wealth of knowledge from reading and listening to all these true crime pieces over the years. So I think I could bring that into a book. And then the course of that shed some light on some cases that people might not know about and also dispel some myths in the true crime world. Um, There were some questions that I researched and myself, I thought I believed one thing and it turns out doing more deep diving research into these cases that I was actually wrong about. So I thought that would be an interesting way for people who know a lot about the genre themselves to read something that someone spent a lot of time researching and and seeing, you know, what things are actually different in some of these cases, what cases did you might not know a lot about that now you do, or what cases have you never heard of before that now you could go out and research and explore for yourself. Very cool. And what is your favorite, I guess, subgenre of true crime that you wrote about in this book? 
I would say it's definitely the um, missing persons and cold cases, just covering some of these stories that really warrant more attention out there. And that, you know, if you get even just a little clue could spark someone to call in something to the police that might lead to solving a case. We saw that with True Crime BS, where we just happened to cover a John Doe on the show. And then a listener heard that and thought that it sounded like someone she knew who was missing. And she took that hunch and she called the state police. And it, it sure enough, it led to this person being identified after his remains were unidentified for more than 10 years. So with that in mind, I thought, you know, you never know when someone could pick up a book or listen to a podcast or a show and say, you know what, that sounds familiar, or I think I might have information in this. So let me call this in or pursue this further and see where it goes. So that was sort of top of mind for me when I was writing that chapter, specifically the cold cases and unsolved mysteries chapter. Great. The uh, two questions that were back to back kind of folds into your answer right there that you just gave. It was uh, question 18 and question 19. And question 18 is about Maura Murray, a college student from the University of Massachusetts, disappeared after, and then you have A, B, C, and D. But the next one is who disappeared about a month after Maura Murray under similar circumstances? And you have Brianna Maitland there as well. So when I read those two back to back, I realized that you told a very involved true crime moment in our history in those two questions. And you told that story in those two questions so concisely that anybody who didn't know about that will definitely look that up and they'll get more information about that. Yeah, I'm glad you pointed that out, Lance, because I actually did have someone, a reader who didn't know much about Brianna's case, mention that specifically. They said, I've heard about Maury Murray, but I didn't know about Brianna. And from TCB, we've covered, as you guys know, we've covered Brianna's case before. So I was aware of it. But a lot of people, they know about Maury Murray, but they don't know that about a month later in the same geographic region, another young woman went missing. So I tried to do that with a lot of these questions. I'm glad you picked up on that, that it's not just about writing any trivia question and like putting random answers. I tried to put a lot of thought into what the other answers would be in the multiple choice and then what other questions would be around one another to kind of shed light on some of these lesser known cases too. And Lance, is it true that you got both of those questions wrong? Yes, I did. I tried it twice and got them wrong twice each. Well, that's weird. We've worked on those cases for such a long time. I'm surprised you got I know. questions wrong. It's very strange. I'm shocked. <laughs> I am too. How'd you do on the podcast chapter? I don't know if you guys listen to a lot of podcasts considering you're so busy working on them, but... I just scrolled until I saw one that I was familiar with, which is this podcast or missing. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, that makes total sense. Okay, so what is that question then? Let's get to that. Is there a question about the missing podcast in here? Yes, there is. Let me just pull it up here. So I'll just say that each chapter has 50 questions in it. I tried to keep it, you know, formula with that. And I tried to include some of my favorite podcasts and podcasts who I know the folks on there. Oh, okay. It's actually number 12 in the podcast chapter. So it is, what is the name of the podcast that began with the investigation of Maura Murray's disappearance? And the choices are A, missing b true crime addict c the vanished or d trace evidence trace evidence and you guys obviously know what it is and all your listeners better know what it is as well it is a missing and then with each question i include like a blurb or a little paragraph or story about the answer so it's not just trivia questions there's actually stories behind each question and behind the trivia so then for this one it says originally called missing maura murray the podcast launched in 2015 and is hosted by tim and lance as the podcast grew tim and lance created crawl space and Crawl Space Media, a podcast network that spans several genres. Through its true crime podcast, the network hopes to, quote, shine a light on and raise funds for cold, unsolved, and missing persons cases. I took that right off your website. I couldn't have said it better myself. Well done. Well, thank you for including us. We really appreciate that. And I love the blurb afterwards in the section with the answers. And did you design this specifically for people to use it in a social way? Yes, I did. I designed it with the thought in mind that readers might read it two ways. One, solo readers could read it and test their own knowledge as a reading. But on the flip side, you could get a group of your friends together or a group of colleagues or fellow, you know, true crime buddies and test your own knowledge with a group and, you know, have a little bit of fun with it as you learn more about some of these cases. And that's why the chapters are organized where the beginning part of the chapter, you don't have the answer below the question, but then the latter half of the chapter, you have the answer right there as well as the blurb about the trivia. And I've had some feedback from some folks who have already used it 
in a sort of trivia night or trivia game setting, and they've really enjoyed it. Cool. And I have to say that this book is perfect if you're going to purchase it through Kindle, because you can have that on your phone, your iPad, your Kindle device, your laptop. But if you're on a plane or something, you can have that. You can scroll. Like, not a lot of books are really good for Kindle in that way, but this one is perfect. So I don't want to, like, downsell your book, and I'm sorry if I'm doing that, but it, it is perfect for, like, your phone device. No, that's a good point, Lance. And also, people have mentioned what you sort of spoke to, but you could pick it up and then put it down and then pick it back up again. You know, it's not like a novel where you're like, oh, what just happened? I completely forgot. You could stop at a question and go back. So it's perfect when you're traveling. This isn't my thing, but some people have mentioned they use it as like a bathroom reader too, which is like, okay, you know, if that's your thing, it's good for that as well. But, you know, we spent a lot of time. I hired a really qualified designer who's done a lot of eBooks and I really wanted to make sure that the eBook version was hopefully as easy to read and navigate as the print version. And we have links for all the questions where if you're reading it solo and you just want to go right to the answer, you can click the answer button and it takes you right to that section in the chapter where the answer is. And then you can go back to where you were. So you don't have to keep hitting, you know, on the Kindle or on your phone scrolling to find the answer. Well, very cool. Yeah, this makes it a lot of fun to learn about these cases. Can you tell us about maybe a couple cases that are little known that you put into the book for that reason? Sure. It might be more of a few cases that are well known, but folks may not have known some of the details of. One that even surprised me when I was researching is the D.B. Cooper case that one of the potential suspects that they considered at one point in time was the John List, the family annihilator. John List committed the crime a few days or a week before the D.B. Cooper hijacking, and some folks thought that this sketch of D.B. Cooper resembled John List enough that they considered him a suspect at one point in time. I believe it was later debunked and that um, List was actually in Colorado at the time of the hijackings, but that was something I had no knowledge of. And then another similar instance of that was with the Black Dahlia case, which, I mean, everyone knows, even if you're just sort of dipping your toes into true crime, you've heard of that case. But she was identified pretty quickly thanks to wire photo service, which was like an early version of a fax machine. Um, That's one of the true false questions in the book. And it's a pretty interesting story how the newspaper kind of entice the police to give them the inside scoop on the case by allowing them to use this wire photo service to send the Black Dahlia's fingerprints over to the FBI in Washington, D.C. And through that technology, they were able to identify her as Elizabeth Short within 56 minutes, whereas it would have taken a lot of time. They originally planned to have a plane take the images over to D.C. And there were some delays with the flights at the time. So they decided to work with the media and use this wire photo technology, which was, like I said, an early version of a fax machine. So that was pretty interesting. And then I think, as I mentioned with the missing persons chapter, I tried to include some cases that folks might not know as much about that are unsolved right now and that some tip might lead to someone finding out. I mean, there are some big cases in there, such as the disappearance of Brian Schaefer. I think that's a well-known one in the true crime space, as well as Bryce Laspisa. That case is coming up on its 10-year anniversary this year. So I kind of had that in mind, some of these timely cases that maybe renewed interest might spark something for folks. Okay, well, I've got a true or false question for you about the Black Dahlia. True or false that my grandma was actually a roommate with Elizabeth Short at one point? I'm going to say true because you're from Massachusetts and she's originally from Massachusetts. So is that true? That's correct. Yes. Oh, yes, I got it right. That's interesting. Put that one in your book. (laughs) Yeah, I might have to. I might have to. If I do another podcast chapter, which host had a relative who roomed with the Black Dahlia? Wow, that's fascinating. Yeah, because I just sort of deep, deep dive her case as well, because I'm hoping to turn some of the trivia questions into YouTube videos, like longer format and also a podcast. And that's the second one I've been working on is there's a lot of really interesting trivia about her case that I think a lot of people don't know and might be interesting to tell her story a little bit more rather than just this horrible thing. Thing that happened to her. You mean more interesting than my grandma being roommates with her? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did she ever tell you much about it? No, no. Honestly, I wish. Kind of got into crime after she was gone, but that is what my aunts and her daughters have said uh, over the years. 
You mentioned John List. Can you explain a little bit of who this is? Because this person actually came about in that TV series, The Watcher, recently this year, right? Oh, yes. And I didn't actually get a chance to watch The Watcher yet. But while I was researching for the book, I came across that story before I knew about the Netflix documentary. And that's a whole other <laughs> fascinating case. But John List was also in New Jersey. And he ended up murdering his entire family and just disappeared. They didn't find the family, the children, for a few days, I believe, because you know it was after they didn't show up to school. And he just went off the grid, started a whole new life out there. I think he ended up in Colorado. And it was years before they found out what he did. And it's just fascinating to me that, yeah, they also considered him as a D.B. Cooper suspect. It's um, a fascinating case. I believe he also killed his mother or his mother-in-law, too. It wasn't just his wife and children, unfortunately. So, And we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Thanks to our sponsors. And now we're back to the program. When you're researching, putting a book like this together, how often do you go down rabbit holes and distract yourself and then have to pull yourself back and get back on track to continue putting these questions together? So you have all of this knowledge going around in your head. How often did you get caught in rabbit holes? Oh, gosh, I think that's probably why this book took me like over two years to finish, because every time, even now I'm working on volume two, and when I sit down and start researching these cases, it's like an hour later, I'm like, how did I get here? You know how some folks you go on with Wikipedia and you click around. I feel like that's what I'm doing for all these true crime cases. I'll find an old newspaper article and then I'm looking up blogs and watching clips of documentaries or listening. I'm like, oh, now I have to listen to this whole podcast on this case. And that takes a lot of time. So it's very often that I go down the rabbit holes myself. And that sometimes helps because then it leads to more questions that I can include. But other times it's like, okay, I have to refocus here. What sort of has helped me is I try to do a lot of writing sessions at local coffee shops while my kids are at school or, or preschool, give myself a little bit of time, a couple hours. And I'm like, all right, I'm on the clock here. I need to get 10 solid questions written, researched, have them all sourced before I leave here. So that helps me focus. But otherwise, yeah, I'm constantly going down different rabbit holes. And I would be so unsure about the correct answer if I didn't know what it was. Which comes first for you, the question or the answer? Oh, that's a good point. I never thought of it like that. I think it's usually the question. Like even now I have some potential questions in mind. Like I want to do a question about Othram and all that they're doing. Well, that, then that's the answer, isn't it? Because I'm thinking about <laughs> Othram as the answer. So there I just uh, contradicted myself. But yeah. So maybe it is the answer, actually. Yeah, you're right. I think it might be the answer. And then I think about some fascinating trivia that I conclude and I know that answer. And then I write the question. But there's been some cases, for instance, um, in the second volume, I'm going to have a chapter about organized crime. And honestly, I didn't really know much about that myself, aside from the big cases like Jimmy Hoffa and those sorts of things. So that took a lot more research where I was actually reading about organized crime. And then as I was reading, coming up with, okay, what could be a trivia question out of this content? So it kind of goes both ways. But for topics I know about, I guess I would say the answer does come first. What about some myths dispelled? Can you give us an example of uh, a myth out there that is maybe commonly believed by folks that you've proven wrong now? Sure. Yeah, this was one that I myself believed as as well. And then as I was researching it more, I uncovered and it's about H.H. Holmes. I mean, most of us know that case. I know a lot of people have read The Devil in the White City. That's still one of my favorite books. But apparently the whole accounts of the murder castle and how it was booby trapped and outfitted with all these means for helping him commit these awful murders that he did commit. A lot of it was sensationalized by the press at the time and yellow journalism at the time to kind of make the story more alluring and sell more papers. And that sort of came about as I was researching that question, because I was like, okay, I'm going to include a question about who had a murder castle, because that's sort of like an easy question a lot of people should know. And as I was looking up the sources, what to include, I was reading an account from a true crime author who he himself, as he was researching, realized later on, oh, okay, newspapers of the time were doing a lot of this sensationalism, and this murder castle may not have been as horrific as it was made to seem in the press. Of course, these crimes were awful, and Holmes was a serial killer, but it may not have been like this kind of haunted house aspect of this murder castle. So I thought that was interesting because I myself believed that all these accounts were true about shoots going down to the basement and that he really had this whole mastermind plan with this castle. And I don't think it was quite to the extent of what we may have been led to believe. Wow. Interesting. So he didn't have any shoots that led into the incinerator in the basement? I think it was figured out that it wasn't quite as elaborate as it made it sound in the press where the shoots were specifically for body disposal. I think a lot of them were just laundry shoots 
methods that they had at the time. And maybe he used it for that, but it wasn't as elaborate with all these booby traps. I know, I think it was from The Devil in the White City. There were accounts of like gas chambers and things like that. So it definitely wasn't as elaborate as it was made to seem. And how do you come up with the uh, fake answers for the multiple choice? So that's another part where I sort of wanted to put in Easter eggs and like call outs to other crimes as well to kind of make it more challenging for people and also have that recognition and give a shout out to some other cases as well that I may not have been able to include. So I tried to be very mindful of that, even with the missing persons cases. Like if I put in a couple other names of missing people, that might help spark someone to look up this case as well. And with the podcast chapter, like, okay, what are some other podcasts that I enjoy? I don't have enough space to include a question, but I could kind of give them a shout out in here. So I thought of it that way. There are a couple of questions, not many, where I kind of included like personal information. I think it's the son of Sam dog question where I included like two names of family pets in there. But most of it is really things that I researched that are callbacks to other true crime cases. Another good example would be the one about Roanoke and the options I included in that include like, I believe it's Helter Skelter, Croatoan, Call Me Fred. And I forget what the fourth option is. The correct answer is Croatoan, but the other ones are related to other true crime cases, obviously Helter Skelter with Charles Manson and then Call Me Fred. I forget now which case that was, but that's from another case as well. So I tried to do that with these questions as well to kind of, you know, make it a little bit more challenging for folks. Gosh, that Roanoke, what is that? Like a village that disappeared? Like a whole colony or something that disappeared? Yeah, a whole colony. And that's actually another question that sort of sent me on a rabbit hole because I guess one of the people who were in the colony was the first child born in the New World, Virginia Dare. I didn't realize that there was that connection to this colony as well. And that's also something where we always hear about Croatoan was like etched on a tree, but I think it turns out it was actually on like a wooden post, which that's not that big of a difference, but it's something when you're doing this research that you need to fact check and be like, oh, okay, it's a little bit different than I thought and that I've heard about before. And there were two words. I think there was also crow, C-R-O was etched into another post as well. And that's a whole mystery of what happened to that group. There's a lot of theories out there, but it was never really solved. In this day of social media where there's information all over the place, for every article that you can find that supports one thing, there's two articles that support the exact opposite. How did you fight through all of that? What sources were you sure about? I mean, Wikipedia is a great resource, but I don't know if you can be sure about everything on Wikipedia. That's a great point, Tim. You really can't be sure about what's on there since anyone can just go on there and edit and change things. Sometimes, like if I had a question in mind, I would use Wikipedia just to see what sources were on there and are those legitimate? For instance, the Black Dahlia, I had to hunt down a rabbit hole to kind of find a definitive answer on if this one part of the case was true. And I actually purchased a couple books that are referenced on the Wikipedia page and I found, okay, this is in this book. So hopefully this is trustworthy enough. So I try to really drill down to more trustworthy news sources using the newspaper archives a lot to actually look up cases as they were unfolding in the press and then use more legitimate current journalism sites, so you know, such as the New York Times or the Los Angeles Times, papers like that. And then I also used a lot of podcasts where they have firsthand interviews with folks. And then if it's missing persons cases, is there a website that the family has that I could find out information that came straight from the source? So that was sometimes a challenge too, because some questions you really couldn't find a solid source, or maybe one source was saying one thing and the other source was saying another. And that was also something that took up a lot of time too, is there were a few questions that I ended up rephrasing or changing because I was like, I can't find a solid definitive answer on this. And I tried really hard to make sure the research was very thorough. I'm sure there might be something in there that I overlooked or missed. Just really tried to do a good job on researching and checking my sources and having a few sources for each question, if possible. I know you said that you're working on volume two of this. I'm wondering if it has crossed your mind to write a book about the experience of writing this book or writing these two volumes, because what you just described right there sounds like a really interesting story as well. Like you going out and digging into these cases in order to compile 350 questions and that leads you to this and that leads you to the library on microfiche. It sounds like a cool journey. It sounds like an eye-opening journey. I actually hadn't considered that, free but idea. now that you say it, that is a good idea. Yeah, free idea. I'll write that down. And if that's the idea that makes me rich and famous, I'll give you a shout out and a cut. <laughs> that would be great if people are interested in that, just hearing more about my journey, maybe even starting off with when I get my YouTube channel up and running to just have some kind of behind the scenes or Q&As like you guys are doing for your show and have people ask me some of those questions to, to see what it's like behind the scenes, because it has been quite a journey. And some folks have told me, either friends or readers, 
that they just can't believe I have this wealth of knowledge. And a lot of it is accumulated over the years from being a true crime listener or reader or or watcher myself. But then spending two years researching all these different cases, I've developed so much more of a knowledge base for true crime. I just want to say it's now on the record. You just offered me a cut (laughs) of your book. The book about the book. The book about the book. (laughs) So if you want to give like a percentage here, that's fine. If we want to just like button it up. 100%. Yeah, I wasn't going to go for 100. 99%. Yeah. Yeah. In that range. All right. So I get 99% of the book. Awesome. Great. Good deal. Of the memoir. Yes. Yes. I know. I'm on record. I can't go back on that. (laughs) I like this one. The true or false question about Tim Allen, whether or not he faced a life sentence for drug trafficking before he became an actor. Oh, my gosh. Yes. Now that you say that, that is one of the stories that I was researching. I'm like, I cannot believe that. That he was supposed to go away for life, essentially, based on the drug laws in Michigan. And he was able to work a deal. You know, he had to narc on a few people. But he got out after a short time. And then that's when he kind of turned his life around and began his comedy career. But that could have totally went a completely different way for him. And we wouldn't even, you know, know who he was or know his story. I mean, could you imagine? how awful this place would be without knowing about Tim Allen's comedy? Holy (laughs) shit, right? I I don't know if I could go on. No Tim, the Tool Man Taylor or um, Toy Story. The Santa Claus, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The Toy Story movies would still exist. They would have gotten a different voice actor. Boy, but if we lost that stand-up and and that sound, that... (laughs) Wow, could you imagine (laughs) how miserable the world would be today? Oh my gosh. And it also makes you think who else out there didn't get that lucky break that could have gone on to do some some amazing things. Well, since we're talking celebrity, I'll keep it on the same topic here. I had no idea that Justin Bieber served two years of probation for anything. I thought he was an angel. Oh, you thought he was an angel? I thought he was an angel. (laughs) Served two years of probation for egging a neighbor's home? Yes. You know, and you have to feel for folks who kind of came of age in the spotlight because they can't have it easy. You hear from a lot of these child actors and, and stars about this but it seemed like he had that period of time where I believe he was doing a lot like uh, drag racing with his car getting in trouble for that and also in his home in California kind of causing a ruckus with the neighbors and it escalated and there was an egging incident and I think he had to pay like $90,000 in damages which isn't a lot for him but just the fact that he did this to his neighbor's house and that they had to put up with that couldn't have been easy for them as well but yeah he did serve two years probation for that and I actually just covered I'm not even not really a huge celebrity person but I feel figured a lot of people do like that topic and there is a lot of interesting stories in that vein but yesterday was actually Justin Bieber's birthday so I took one of the questions I have in the book about him to um, go into more depth about but there is actually this awful plot by a man who is in prison for murder he was already serving a life sentence and I guess he was a fan and he was sending fan mail to Justin which was not answered and he decided to hatch a plan to have a fellow cellmate who was getting released go and kill him so he was hiring a hit on him and luckily police foiled the this plan before it came to fruition. But, you know, this is pretty scary stuff that celebrities have to deal with on a regular basis. Like, you know, even from folks who are already incarcerated and shouldn't be able to enact a plan like this. But yeah, so there's a lot of questions in that chapter that, like I said, myself, I'm not like big into celebrities or one of those folks who catches up on those trends and what's going on. But just researching that, there was a lot of interesting cases. And then also stories of celebrities who have done good in that field, like Madonna, one of her boosty haze was stolen from a Fredericks of Hollywood store during the LA riots. And she offered to donate a new one to the Hollywood of Fredericks store as long as they made a donation, a sizable donation to an organization that offered free mammograms for women. So there's cases where celebrity and crime intersect and then some good comes out of it. So I wanted to include some cases like that in that chapter as well. I really like how you included Corey Feldman here as well, how he advocates against sexual abuse of children children. That is a topic that we've talked about on our bonus shows, uh, Lance, our uh, subscription service. Corey Feldman's very passionate about this, and obviously who wouldn't be, but he was a child actor in the 1980s, so he actually has some firsthand knowledge of the problems in Hollywood with sexual abuse of children. 
which is quite startling. Yeah, and that's why he's used that because he's been very vocal about it for years now. But it was nice when I was researching this to learn that he's become an advocate for preventing it and calling attention to it and what's going on. That's good that you brought that up because I wanted to focus on that as well, that there are celebrities doing good in the criminal justice field, whether you're a fan of theirs or not. You know, Kim Kardashian comes to mind. You know, a lot of us aren't necessarily fans of hers, but she is trying to help with prison reform and have attention put on cases in the legal field. So there are people trying to do good out there in in the world of true crime. So presented with a challenge, would you be able to answer all 350 questions correctly in this book? Hmm. You know, I want to say yes, just because I've read it so many times. I even during the proofing process read it out loud like four times, which took a long time just to make sure that it all sounded good and that I caught anything that I may have slipped through the cracks. So I want to say I would get it right, but there might be a few of the statistic questions that might trip me up now that I don't necessarily know because numbers can be tricky. Is it, you know, 5,000 unsolved murders a year or 2,500? I'm not sure I could answer that right now. So I don't know if I could get them all right now. I should challenge myself. Well, let's do it right now. (laughs) All right. Let's see what I get right. Question one. (laughs) <laughs> so when are you expecting to receive a cease and desist or have you already received one from Rebecca Sebastian? <laughs> oh, no, I haven't. Oh, because she does the um, she hosts a true crime show. Yeah, right? Yellow tape. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a joke. She's a lovely, lovely human. No, I met her um, when I met you guys in Saratoga. She's great. I was actually thinking I should reach out to her because she's such a good host with trivia that she who knows she may want to take some of the questions and use them for one of her shows. We'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsor. And a thank you to our sponsors. Back to the program. I see a whole chapter in here about heists and robberies. And I did see a question about the Gardner heist. So I think that's an interesting one. Do you find that case interesting? The uh, the Gardner heist of Boston? Yes, I found that one really interesting just because they have, I believe it's the largest bounty offered by a private institution for the return of these works. And it's kind of like, where are these priceless pieces of art hiding right now? And that's the one where the robbers dressed as police officers, if I'm remembering correctly. So just the fact that they were able to pull this off is pretty wild and that it happened right over in Boston and still unsolved. I was looking for, uh, I actually did a search of our podcast Empty Frames and didn't find it. Oh, podcast Empty Frames. I didn't know you guys had one about that specific heist. Season one is all about the heist and then we do some other art crimes in season two and we still kind of go back to it if there are updates. But yeah, that was just, I was being sarcastic. (laughs) Don't expect you to know every single... I take things seriously sometimes. We do have the podcast, (laughs) Empty Frames, but I was being sarcastic about giving you a hard time. Oh, no, but I want to listen to that because I don't think I've mentioned this specifically, but a lot of people have told me, and I myself found this, that the heist chapter was one of the most eye-opening for folks because a lot of us in true crime, we don't necessarily read or listen to heist case, but I mean, there's like movie level heists that have occurred around the world. So I'm sort of more into it now and learning about these cases. I'll have to check that out. Yeah, this cheese heist in Wisconsin. That's crazy. Tell us about that. That sounds made up, doesn't it? (laughs) And actually, this kind of ties into another question in the heist chapter. It's the last question in that chapter. But what's the most shoplifted food in the world worldwide? And it is, in fact, cheese, because I guess it's easy to steal. Some of it's quite expensive. But yeah, in Wisconsin, there are actually more than two, if I'm remembering correctly, high profile cheese heists in the span of a short period of time, where a large number of like Parmesan went missing. And just thinking about how are you going to store this cheese? Or what are you going to do with it? I mean, I guess if you're using it at a restaurant you're or something. You're going to eat it, Michelle. You eat the evidence. That's how you never get caught. That's a good point. But I think if any of us ate that much <laughs> cheese, our cholesterol might spike quite a bit. <laughs> I think it's funny that there's a cheese heist in Wisconsin and it made me think about other heists in other states like that they're known for a particular thing because there was the maple syrup heist in Canada. Do you ever hear like a lobster heist in Maine? I should look that up. And if there is, I should add it for the next volume. But there is, I don't know if you saw this question in there, but there are a lot of heists of beehives out in California. That's something that thieves have been targeting lately because there's a demand for bees with the increased demand in almonds for almond milk and products with 
with almonds. So the price of a heist jump, I think it was from $30 a hive to $200 a hive. So it kind of made it a target for these hives to be stolen by thieves. And there's a special task force of police in California where a lot of these hives are that kind of specialize in that sort of crime. So that's California's claim to fame with heists. Yeah, but I'll have to see if there's any lobster heists. That would be interesting. How do you get into the underground beehive black market? You need informants. If you're investigating this, you need to get the bees on your side. Do you imagine stealing a beehive? And it's crazy because it has to be other people in that field. So then you're like, you're stealing from your colleagues and your, you know, I guess competitors too, but that's just awful. And yeah, if you get stung. Yeah, you must be dressing up like in the protective gear because you're certainly not picking up a beehive and moving them. <laughs> like, like, you'd be dead. I'm going to join that task force. You're going to help fight bee crime. I know some other people, some fellow colleagues who can join forces. I think, as I said, because I've been turning a lot of these trivia questions into like short TikTok videos or YouTube shorts. And in the beehive heist one, I was like, you know, these honeybees already have enough. They're endangered. And now they have to worry about being stolen. It's just wild. I was very disappointed, though. My only criticism about your book is that D.B. Cooper was brought up on question 16, like right away, like in the first 20. <laughs> you wanted him brought, want up brought up later on? <laughs> no. Lance loves D.B. Cooper. True or false? Tim has a dog that he named D.B. Pooper. <laughs> um, I'm going to say false. You are correct. <laughs> <laughs> okay that, that would be a funny name for a dog though but then calling the vet to make the appointment <laughs> explaining that yeah one. that would be fun that would be funny well this has been a lot of fun here michelle are there any other cases or questions that you'd like to highlight here sure i think one other aspect of writing this book that was interesting to me was learning some more about the history of like forensics and some of those stories such as the first time that dna was used to solve a murder or that fingerprint evidence was used to solve in a murder case. The first one I mentioned, the DNA, that was in 1986 with the case of Colin Pitchfork in the UK. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that case at all. But there was a genetics professor who had used DNA technology in a number of immigration cases. But the police came to him and said, we have these two murders. A suspect actually confessed to both, but they believed that he didn't actually commit both crimes. So they had this genetics professor look into it, and he was able to uncover that the second case, the second murder, was actually committed by a different person and this was a man named Colin Pitchfork who is still incarcerated to this day but that was the first time DNA technology was used to solve a murder and then on the flip side back in 1892 police in Argentina used fingerprint evidence for the first time at least the first time on record to solve a case to prove that unfortunately a mother murdered her two children and tried to cast blame on the neighbor luckily for the neighbor the police were able to go back to their investigation and find this fingerprint evidence that really proved that the mother did it and then she confessed but that was sort of fascinating learning some more of these backstories and the historical aspects of forensics and true crime that i think readers have enjoyed learning about as well well it is a incredibly enjoyable read and you said that some people have said that it's like a bathroom read and in the beginning of this when i paused i kind of stuttered because i was going to say this is a great bathroom book but i said if you're on an airplane instead my brain was trying to come up with another thing to say so i'm glad that i'm on the same page with other people it is a perfect bathroom read and that is no way (laughs) at all an insult actually my neighbor and then someone else told that to me and at first like when I heard that and my husband heard it we're like is that like an insult? And then we're like, well, no, for people who are like have that stack of books in their bathroom, that's great because then new people are looking at it, they're picking it up, they're flipping to a question, learning about a true crime case that they might go home and go down that rabbit hole about and learn more about. So I think it's actually a good thing. It is. Good work. Yeah, great job. Thanks, yeah. guys. Thank you so much for hanging out with us today and telling us about your book. Do you have any plans for another book beyond the, uh, the second edition? Yeah, so what I want to do after the second edition is maybe write another more general true crime book. Since heists have been pretty popular, maybe like 25 of the world's wildest heists and make a compilation. And then as I get a few more books under my belt and people start to recognize my name and understand my approach, I would like to cover some cases that really deserve a deep dive and more attention. Cases that families may be asking for someone to cover. I know there's a case from my hometown, an unsolved murder, that the family keeps bringing up and they would really like to get some more attention on it. And then other cases that come to mind, such as the West Mesa 
a bone collector case, that's still unsolved. So if there's something I could do, a case that I could cover in the future that might help call more attention and lead to some new answers in those cases, I would love to be part of that and use my writing for more good out there, just in addition to sort of the infotainment aspect of like a trivia book, but delve deeper as well. Thank you.